Welcome to Gradcast 125. You see my, my seat on my right is empty. It's going to be filled here shortly, but before we bring in our guest this week, the actor Cash Hovey, I want to say a few words. John, who we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, uh, is no longer going to be with the show. Apparently, uh, John's been fighting through a uh, dark place for the last couple of weeks. We've reached out to him. We've done everything we can to talk to him. And uh, he's pushed everybody away and, and kind of gone into that dark place. It's not a, not, not a good place to go to, and I don't suggest that you turn away from your friends when you do that. We're all concerned and hoping for John, but for the time being, he has chosen to resign from Gratcast. So the show goes on. Uh, we've got great guests lined up, starting today with Cash Hovey. But before we bring in Cash, I want to talk about some of the things happening later this week. Uh, Fridays, we are expanding Gratwick Gaming. Uh, every Friday at 1 p.m., we've got our uh, Gretwick and Max Fight Club for Red Dead Redemption 2, where everybody shows up, we've got a bare-knuckle brawl, and winner gets 25 gold bars. Following that up, starting this week, is going to be our, our duels. Uh, Max's Fight Club duels is coming this Friday. That'll be starting at 2.30. Got the graphic up on screen there. If you want to join uh, either the, the Duels, Max's Fight Club, or starting at 4 p.m. after that, the Apex Qualifier Tournaments, uh, just join us on Gratcast or in the Discord. Uh, that's discord.me slash Gratwick, and jump right in, and we'll get you in our gaming community. Uh, let's see. A couple other things on this week to update on. We, uh, we had two interviews earlier in the week. We were on the Dr. Tanji show with uh, Jeannie Jones. That's available on LA Talk Radio, and coming up May 18th, I'm going to be on the Douglas Coleman Show. So if you get a chance, give both those shows a, a follow and a subscribe. Great people, and without no further ado, let's bring in Cash Hovey and get our long-awaited guest in studio. Cash, welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks for having me. This has uh, been a long time coming. This has been. Y'all, y'all, good there with the mic. You hear everything? I think good we're to good. Go? We see. Yeah, let's. Uh, we're good to go, my friend. All right, yeah. let's jump right into it. So, for those who don't know, we met Cash at the hundredth episode of Gratcast. He was uh, the guest of Kathy Cola, who was there to talk about Plastic Daydream. Cash is one of the actors that was in that film, along with uh, Sherry Belafonte. Uh, Cash, let's let's start let's start at the beginning. Yeah. Where 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 about you from, Cash? I'm from Los Angeles. I was born in Santa Monica. Okay, natural, uh, natural born LA person. This huh? is my town. Oh, <laughs> our first unicorn on the show. <laughs> so, you know, I want to ask, what's what was the thing that really stuck out for you growing up in LA? Because all I think about all the time is is how much farther down the road I'd be if I if I grew up here, if I came out here a whole lot whole lot younger and earlier. Right. So for you, for you growing up here from day one, right. Huh? How was uh what what was life like? You know, I just I mean my earliest memories were just um you know my parents' living room watching movies and recreating scenes from my favorite movies, playing with blocks, and I just really liked creating things. I would draw a lot. I was drawing scenes, so it was just really I've always had that creative. Were you spirit. always aware that Hollywood existed as far as like a career path and a career choice? Was that something you kind of grew grew up with with being here in L.A. and having it all around? You know, it really. Um, I was always very passionate about films and movies, and then just as I got older, I just I would find more people who would introduce me to things, and even just growing up and like walking into a blockbuster and seeing a movie, and just I mean I guess like my earliest memories of movie stars were like Tom Cruise and Jim Carrey, and you know, you'd go to blockbuster, you see like the mask posters around, yeah, and you'd be yeah. like oh my god, you know I mean we probably saw Dumb and Dumber numerous times on VHS, <laughs> absolutely, <you know? laughs> yeah. So uh, what would you say, Do you, is there a movie or a, a moment you remember when the, the light went off and you really started paying attention to actors on screen and saying, that's something I want to do? Oh, yeah. Well, my earliest, I mean, I was like, I had a toy car that I could fit into and I was like recreating the DeLorean scenes from Back to the Future. <laughs> I was, oh, yeah. No, my mom was like pictures like of me. Like Backyard Games. There's actually a picture my mom showed me. It's like, it, it, it's literally the caption is, he's watching Back to the Future the first time. And I got like a little <laughs> mullet. And I'm just really intense. And I got like the jeans and the suspenders. But um, yeah, and I would go to school in costumes all the time. And so I was like, I, I would dress up as like um, Carrie Ellis's character from Princess Bride all the time. I dressed like Marty McFly a lot. And I had a Ghostbusters uniform we were always wearing. And nice. uh, so I, I watched Stranger Things now. I'm like, dude, that was... 
<laughs> that was us. I, I mean, it was like in the 90s, but like, yo, that's, yeah, we had all that. But like, at that age, were you like, I wanted to be the character on screen or were, did you want to be the actor? Oh, I wanted, I, I wanted to be the characters, I guess, when I was a kid. But then when I, you know, for me, I had a friend and we would create, we would do movies on um, our parents' camcorders. And he was the one who really introduced me to like, uh, that's when I started watching like What's Eating Gilbert Grape. And it really got me into like Johnny Depp and Leonardo DiCaprio and then we watched this movie called uh, Basketball Diaries, which yep, was a yep. classic. And that was really a movie where we, um, I was really, I just remembered watching Leonardo DiCaprio's performance and be like, you know, that's an actor. This is, these are the kinds of That was of kind of when you're all in. Yeah, definitely. I mean, just watching that performance and, you know, that was one of his breakthrough roles aside from Gilbert Grape. And then um, from then on, it was like Boogie Nights and just, and for, for us, it was like growing up in the Valley. It's like we weren't around during that time, obviously, but to watch it, you know, years, many years after yeah. the movie took place. There was still an essence of wow, that's the San Fernando Valley. That's where we grew up. Like all these places, we um, ring a bell to us, and that was and that was a movie. And then uh, so many stars. You have Don Cheadle, Alfred Molina, uh, Thomas Jane, uh, uh, um, Julianne Moore. I mean, it was just such a huge movie with such a brilliant cast. So one of the things that's come up recently, before we kind of get more into kind of your acting and all that, I want to throw a, a yeah. hardball at you here early on. Uh, Spielberg's picked a beef with Netflix, yeah. and uh, bigger picture wise, the whole streaming community in general. Uh, grumpy old man, he feels like you you should have to do your time in the theaters before you can be Oscar eligible. Are you uh, are you are you aware of of this beef that started, and and where do you fall on it? Yeah, I, I'm. I'll be honest. I've just heard bits and pieces. I don't have all the facts. Um, I am a big Spielberg fan his movies well he was the executive producer on Back to the Future I respect him I very much I grew up on Spielberg films. love his movies but you know and um, you know I uh, that was a dream for me too I mean you know to be able to watch your movie in a theater you know I've had very few moments where you know you can see something in a theater and when you like see your masterpiece yeah. up there, it really does mean something so I always want theaters to be around but you know, I do enjoy watching binge watching, and Netflix has actually introduced me to a lot of movies I just never knew existed. I mean, there's, I mean, oh, there's been sure. so many yeah. relevant movies, and I mean, I think that. Um, well, correct me if I'm wrong. Roma was one of the uh, movies that. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not even sure if that was in the theaters at all for like a limited period of time or for um, an extended uh, period of time. But the the gist of it, for those that don't know, is the Oscars have a requirement where you have to have a limited screening before you can be Oscar eligible. And Netflix has kind of skirted those rules, gotten kind of the, the bare minimum on that, and now everybody's in an uproar in Hollywood, starting with Steven Spielberg, and thinks this is going to be the death of, of the theater chains. That if we don't force this grace period where the movie, where, where major blockbuster movies only have, the theaters only have access to them for six weeks or, or shorter, before it goes to digital, then that's going to be the death of theater chains, and nobody's going to go there anymore. Um, are, would, would you stop going to the theater if you had the option on day one to watch it online? Or I mean, th there's movies that I just want to go see in the theater. I mean, I will literally go up because I just need to see a movie. You know, I mean, I need to get yeah. out of the house. And I think people really want to do that. I mean, we, you can spend so much time in the house binge watching something. You'd be like, you know, I got to get out. Friday night rolls around. It's a good date night. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think theaters will always be around. I, I don't think they're going to be at the forefront the mm -hmm. way they've, they've been right. and they're fading away from. But mm -hmm. I think they'll, they'll stay around as a novelty activity. Something like, hey, I haven't gone to the theater forever, or this is a big action movie, go see that. But I don't think, and I don't even really think it is at this point, people's first choice. Like, if you can go watch it online, mm -hmm. there's a whole lot a lot more convenience to watching that online. And I think the option should be available. If I want big, loud speakers and a huge screen, let me go to the theater and watch it. But, like, we shouldn't be regulating the movie theaters to keep them in business. I mean, look, I... I love to get out to the theater. I mean, I growing up in cinema, you wanna you wanna have that experience. But I mean, I think yeah, we need a you know times change. We should look at. I mean, because Netflix does a great service to. I mean, to all of us, just to be able to binge watch shows, create and get our content out there. I mean, it's been such a great avenue, and there's a lot of good things from it. But at the same time. I totally agree with what you're saying, where it's like there are certain movies that you do want to yeah. see in the theater. You want the theater experience. but And that's what I do like about the Lemley Theaters, because even there are certain art movies that, you know, you can go, you can have a glass of wine, you can have some popcorn, you can chill. It's, it's oh, yeah, they just gotta, yeah. they got to add more experience add, if they want to keep getting people out of the house. Definitely, of course. But the, the thing that doesn't make sense to me is that the, the Oscars, 
it's almost another example of the of kind of the Hollywood insider collusion in that and boxing out the little guys because the Oscars should be about the best film, about the quality of the content, not the medium in which I see it on. It doesn't matter if I watch the movie on the phone, if I watch it in the theater, if I if I watch it on a VHS tape, whatever the medium is, if it's a good film, it's a good film. And the Oscars should be looking for the best film, not the best film that went through this medium. Because, all right, say, say Steven Spielberg gets his own way and and this whole blockade happens and it has to screen in the theaters to be eligible. Now every movie that doesn't screen in the theaters is no longer eligible. So to me, Best Picture loses some of its cachet, some of its importance, because you didn't really go up against all the other pictures. You only went up against the certain ones that were released in the theaters. There's plenty of other great movies you don't have to compete against because they didn't get released in the theater. And now I think you have to put an asterisk next to your best, best picture every year hmm. because it's been it's been qualified by the fact that you didn't you didn't face the whole competition field of competition. Mm-hmm. Just something that that's, that's been kind of on the on the topic and and uh, no, and it is a discussion. No, and I mean I I follow what you're saying and what you're. Um, the points you're bringing up, and you know, I think you know we'll see what happens in the next few years. I mean, everything. I mean, I I couldn't have foreseen Netflix even happening a few years ago. I mean, I I can remember where it was just a, you know, you call or uh, how was it they would just send you movies in the mail? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I remember that about our, our neighbor few, down the street still doesn't. Yeah. She trades the DVD with us all the time. This was a few <laughs> years ago. My uh, this uh, girl I was dating at that I was like, oh yeah, we and it was a Ryan Reynolds movie, and it was like, oh, it just came yeah. out. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And then <laughs> now it's like the service we all go to. So I mean, I think time will tell. You know, every, every once so people come around and we. I think I think sites like Netflix and YouTube and and things like that. I think they're they're more of a stepping stone. And I think you're already starting to see see this change happen on the uh, on the the majors level. So Disney used to have all of their Marvel movies and stuff in Netflix, right. and mm-hmm. they're now pulling them all out and they're pulling them from all the platforms and creating their own Disney distribution platform. Mm-hmm. And I think ultimately that's where it's all going to head. Each brand of content, each production company, each filmmaker is going to have their own digital media platform, and that's where you to go to, you go to watch their content as, as as opposed to these collectives that have content from all over the different places i just think ultimately the middleman is going to get cut right out mm. you're going to save yourself all of those percentages and then like channels used to be where you flip through channels each person will have their own different platform and and that's where you'll you'll consume content from each brand right so you uh you accomplished something at the age of 17 that i i admire a great deal and it's something at 10 years in la that that i've yet to be able to accomplish you got a you got an agent at 17 years old how, how did you know to go looking for an agent and how did you make that happen at such a young age you know actually um i th- you know, I, I got an agent when I was about 15. I did a showcase with a girl I went to. Her mom was my instructor. I did a showcase with them, and I was approached by an agent. And, uh, you know, I kept auditioning, and I was up for some stuff. And at the time, I was, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I auditioned straight for a year, and then I was, I think, 17 when, um, it, this was actually a wild story. So it's my last day of high school. I literally, it's my last, I'm sorry, let me start back. It was my last week of high school. I went out for this audition and I'd seen, you know, I was in a room with people that I was seeing on as guest boss on shows who I admire. I'm like, oh, good, you know, congratulations. And um, I went and I had like long hair and um, I was kind of going through, I guess, a Jim Morrison phase or something at the time. <laughs> I got to. <laughs> so then we um, lean into it. So we went in there, we did the audition, and then I went in to take my last, like, this was like literally my last test of high school. And then I walk out and I looked at myself and uh, my agent called me, you booked the part. I'm like, what? So I went from, Literally, my last test, I went home, went to sleep, and then I was on set the next day doing two commercials for Joe Pitka. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a nice career path. Yeah. <laughs> so what's it, what's the experience like working with an agent? So a lot of people have these pie-in-the-sky dreams. As long as I get an agent, all my problems are solved. Mm-hmm. I'll be working and, and, and making money as an actor forever. What's, what's the reality like from your perspective of working with an actor? What are the pros and cons? What are some of the, the, the limitations that you have to, to navigate now that you have representation and you can't just kind of wild, wild west it? Well, I mean... <clears throat> I mean, bring up an interesting point, and I understand that that mindset that you've described. But I think, like in any industry, even entertainment, you really have to be passionate about what you do. You have to go out there, and I mean, you know, you can wait by the phone and ask someone or expect someone to do something for you, or you can go out there and make the magic yourself. I mean, and and my agent has gotten me great auditions. We have a great relationship with my uh, representation, but at the same time, I got to do my part, and I got to go out there, and I got to meet filmmakers yeah. i got to meet people that i want to work with and i mean i think that's really i mean 
you, you just always have to stay a step ahead no matter where you are and what you do. So would you say the, the typical agent relationship is more you keep grinding and hustling on your own, open doors, opportunities, and then you can lean on the agent and to bring them in, close it, negotiate everything pro pro professionally, make sure you're all taken care of and what, what that I opportunity mean, is? That end, I totally agree. And of course, I would love to be in a position where I can just wait for a call and be like, you know, you book this, you're up for this, that would be great. Um, I hope to be at that level someday. But I mean, the reality is, is just, you know, I, you know, you really have to go out there, you have to meet filmmakers, you have to meet other artists that share your passion. And entertain, I mean, it's just acting and uh, making movies and just doing anything entertainment. It's, it's a team effort. You know, you can be so I mean, I, I have friends who are just so talented and passionate about what they do. And then they, you know, they have a representative who's just really good at the business angle. So it's yeah. so many things complement each other. Just even I like my relationship with Kathy Cole. I mean, we complement each other on so many levels. I mean, I think that's a huge factor that's completely unaccounted for. Most people don't think of on all of that, that no matter how talented you are at a certain set of skills and all of that, that a big part of the, the success in the path is finding those people that complement your skills and vice versa where you complement them mm -hmm. to make that team where you carry forward and you work together and, and you fill in those blanks for each other. Definitely. So before we before we get to Cafe Cola and uh, Plastic Daydream, I want to know more about kind of as the younger age of acting. When did you, what was your first audition like? When? How old were you when you took your first acting class? Oh gosh, I was, you know, I, I was doing plays in middle school and we, we were, by that time, we were already, I mean, we were like recreating scenes from Basketball Diaries and uh, we were doing, we, we, Do any of these whole movies still exist? Yeah, I, there, there's one, uh, I, I know it's on VHS at my mom's house somewhere, but I have this one with um, Dylan Francis, he's a DJ now, it was me, him, and uh, two other friends of ours, and we were, I mean, we were like running through and like doing these like Basketball diaries -esque scenes, and then another friend of ours, Michael Schumann, who's in Queens of the Stone Age now, he we were like doing a home movie. So it was just weird. Like all these guys that I grew up with in the Valley were just, <laughs> I've gone on and done stuff like, yeah, I remember back in the day, we were just like kids on a video yeah. camera doing this. <laughs> See, I love that part though. The whole, you want to do this, you want to do that. I want to do this. Let's all get together and make mm -hmm. something all that. Yeah. The, the movie that really set the light off for me that it was possible and you could do all of those things. Clerks helped a little yes. bit, but it was, oh, yeah. it was swingers for me was the one that did it. Reading the story about John Favreau, Vince Vaughn and all those guys, how they were all out of work. And they're like, well, we've got an actor, we've got a director, we've got a writer, we've got everything we need to make a movie. Oh, yeah. Let's just go ahead and do it. And oh, exactly. I, I think there's not enough people still in Hollywood that are just looking to make some stuff with friends. Like, everyone's so worried about, well, what does the job pay? What does the gig pay? Oh, these people aren't paying anything? Screw them. They're probably at the same level you are, and they're, they're just looking, not you, but like the, the person looking for the opportunity. They're all, you got to find the people at the same level as you and just start creating stuff, man. If you, all you care about is that day rate and you don't have any kind of resume, you're never going to get a day rate. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's too many people that are just afraid to, to spend the time and effort making stuff with their friends out here, and they mm -hmm. think everything has to be a professional production. No, I mean, and, and it's good to set goals because we all want to be on those professional uh, productions. But at the same time, there's been so many great film festivals here in L.A., like Holly Shorts and Dances with Films. And I have met so many amazing people who I've networked with. And, and, and I find that group mentality does exist still. I mean, even just some of the people that I've currently um, had relationships with and worked with. I mean, they, they're my inspiration. And we'll just sit down and have an idea, like, let's roll with this and let's get this going. Yeah, that's, that's the best atmosphere, I feel, to cultivate success. And mm -hmm. is, even if it's just one person that comes from that to cultivate success, that person can throw back opportunities for the whole group. And it just, just raises the, the waters for the, the entire boat. Oh, absolutely. So... You've, you've been acting for quite a while now and had a lot of experiences on set. What's the, the, the most memorable experience you've had while, while shooting something and, and being in a production? Yeah, um, I do have to, not just because it's current, but I do have to say Plastic Daydream was really something that just came together so well. It was just such a fond experience and just something I can really look back on and say, wow, that was, uh, that really... You know, was there any kind of specific moment or anything while you guys were shooting? Yeah. I mean, when you were on set with Sherry Belafonte? You know, that there were just so many levels about it. I mean, I remembered at the end, like, I had known Kathy for um, for a while. Like, for about a year, we kept... I mean, I... A colleague and a, and a good friend of mine was in her uh, documentary who is... Uh, Who's Billy Bones? Billy Bones. Yes, yeah, we saw that. Yeah, yeah. It. No, it's, it's an incredible, uplifting documentary. And she invited me to... Um, 
that they had the premiere party for it. And so I attended and that's where I met Kathy. And then uh, we kept in contact. I kept letting Kathy know when I had premieres and stuff happening. And she was, Kathy was always supportive. She was always there. And then by the end of the year, we started getting a, a crew going. And, um, you know, I just do my thing. Like I reach out to people and like, you know, let's, let's get something going. And Kathy and I, we met up, we were going to a party and we decided to just um, have grab some coffee. And we were like, we got to make something together. Let's do something. And then, with it less than a month later, she had this script ready and then we're like, where do we go? And we had so many ideas of what to do. And then I just picked up the phone and called Sherry this, this, will, and then we needed a doctor's office and my dermatologist for, for 10 years, I think he's been saying like, you know, gosh, oh, so you're an, Hey, you know, if there's any part for a doctor, <laughs> let me know. And then and it was just, and then, um, I had just seen him and I said, and I called him, I said, you know, we, we actually need a doctor's office. We need someone to play. It's like, oh, done. And so we, <laughs> Can't beat that. and it was just, everything just kept falling into place. And then to actually be on set and just the location, this beautiful location out in Thousand Oaks was just, uh, it was just such a memorable experience. And then, you know, just to be able to work with, I mean, Sherry and Kathy and just, it was so, so, so did Kathy write that role for you or did she already have that project kind of developed and realized you were the perfect one for the character? You know, I, You'd have to ask Kathy about the specifics, but we met, we wanted to do a project, and she said, "This, I, I want you to do this, and we need to do this together. Nice. Yeah. So, uh, I want to ask you about both ladies, but yeah. let's, let's start with Sherry Belafonte. Mm -hmm. She's uh, a wide-ranging, talented actress that's been around for a while. Oh, yeah. What... How, did you know her before the the show? Did did you have a relationship with her beforehand? Yes, or? I've I've known Sherry for many years. She's so cool, so friendly, and um, yeah. So how how did uh, the experience go of getting her on set and all that? How did you guys get her excited about the part and the opportunity? You know, we um, I, you know, I've known Sherry for many years, and we we needed uh, someone to play that role. I I spoke to her. I said, "We're um, this woman I work with, Kathy Cola. We have this uh, film. We need." would you be interested? She's like, send it my way. So I sent it to her and then she read it. And then the next thing I know, we uh, met her at this restaurant in Calabasas and over dinner, it was, it was done. Can't be making movie deals uh, <laughs> over dinner in Calabasas. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's how you get there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Kathy Cola now plastic day, plastic daydream. What, what's going on with that right now? Where's it headed? Do you guys have any other projects in the works that you're, you're rolling this forward from? Oh yeah, we have, um, well, it already screened. Thank you so much. You, I know you attended, uh, La Femme Film yep, Fest. Yep, 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 that yep. was our, thank you both for attending. Uh, that was our first premiere back in October. Then, uh, Film Fest LA Live, we... Yeah, just for social yeah. media, you guys been all over with this thing. <laughs> And then it just uh, screened at uh, the Pan African Film Festival, and we have a few more submissions. So we're gonna, yeah, whatever, whatever will take us, we will happily promote it and screen it. Nice. Have you guys started developing any any other secondary projects? Something to follow this up with and oh, keep yeah. the collaboration we, going. We um we can't talk about it yet, but we've de this definitely um ignited something. It got and we the have, wheels going. It got the wheels going, and we've had other projects uh that we've worked on this past year. But we're um yeah we're we got some things in the works. So, how many productions in your career so far would you say, how many sets have you been on? Oh, gosh. Um, rough estimate. It rough we're not going to you, hold you to it. <laughs> uh, maybe 20. 20? Okay. How many of those sets would you say were run by a female? Oh, you know, that's... Yeah, I'd have to... S I don't want to say 50-50. I've actually... I, I will say I have been on predominantly female-run sets. Really? Yeah. Oh, you're kind of the eyeball on that one, too. <laughs> So you've had more than one female director then? Uh, definitely, yeah. Okay. What are what are some of the experiences that you found out that is kind of a little bit different on how maybe maybe the female director handles an actor versus a, a male director? What's something specific you learned from working with Kathy Cola that, that has advanced your career or right. made you a better actor? You know, the thing that I just love about Kathy so much is that we, like, we know each other thinking, like, I know, like... Yeah, there's just certain things that Kathy's great at, certain things I'm great at. So we just, you know, we just synergize and we create the best work and the best outcome because of that. We're very open and, and know what each other need. And uh, at the same time, we know what will make our project great. And that's what I found on set with her. There was just very, um, I mean, you know, just like things come up on set. We got to roll with it. And, but we always, it, it was just such a team effort and teamwork and everything. We just make everything work well. So there's no reason that ladies shouldn't be 50-50 uh, at least? Uh, I'm sorry, what was it? Females in, in leadership roles on productions and sets like that. 
there's there's no reason that uh, we shouldn't be looking at a 50 50 rate here right you're just saying i th no I'm, I'm all about balance but i think we you know it, it all comes down to the best uh the best candidates um qualified and all i can say about the female um my colleagues i mean i i love them all they've been i mean i've learned so much from kathy and sherry alone and uh, the uh filmmaker who did uh, Jack and Cocaine and Undateable John was a female writer, director. Well, actually, she directed and produced me in Jack and Cocaine. This is an indie movie I did a few years back. And then the upcoming Undateable John, she wrote it. I mean, uh, that was Cynthia Posner. And we were, wait, she had just written, she was just, she had an epiphany. <laughs> she wrote the script. She's like, and just the All way she got the best ones, you just she, No, out. I mean, she just, she rolled with it, got it done. And then the next thing we knew, we were, uh, months later, we were on set shooting it. And then right afterwards, she wrote Jack and Cocaine for me. And we shot that. We shot that in six days. It was a guerrilla style film, but it was like, that, that was the fun part about it. And I was with, um, uh, Cynthia and Jenna the whole time. We'd have like different co-stars coming up, but it was just like... Is that one stars. available for anyone to, to watch anywhere? Yes, actually, you can watch it on Vimeo. Just uh, You can Google it. It's uh, Jack and Cocaine. Um, we actually... Um, the Valley Film Festival actually premiered it in 2017. And we and that that was just... We didn't really know what to do with it with the mark. And this we actually shot that before I knew everything I knew about film festivals. And so we just put it out there and we ended up getting a good response from it. The festival wanted to screen it. We've had CIE Fashion Magazine cover it a few times. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Nice. So Undateable John is the, the newest project. The yes. one thing you've done the most recently, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what, what's that one about? Tell us about that one. That one has to do with, um, well, Undateable John, he's... Um, Are you John? I'm not John, no. <laughs> I'm his rival in it. <laughs> uh, I'm, I play Adam in Undateable John, but um, John Philbin from... Are you Dateable? Uh, in, in the movie, I think I'm pretty dead again. Um, did you just, My character at least did thinks Did you just drop the name John Philbin? Yeah, he's the star of Undateable John. Yeah, he's so John? Like, he's John. We uh, we are very familiar with John Philbin. Mm -hmm. He was uh, one of the, the actors in our movie, The Perfect House. We, wow. Yeah, we flew him all the way back to oh Buffalo. And yeah, he was in uh, the the third, the dinner guest story, um, the, the third in our anthology. Yeah, he's oh, he, it's a yeah, small world. Come yeah, on, yeah, we'll show together. We just find this out. This yeah, yeah, he's he's a character, man. You know, you know, he was so fun. Man. We yeah, we well, actually, the scene that I, me and him had it was like a big showdown scene. So it, it'll be out in uh, June, so you can uh, catch that. Nice. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know he was the the lead in that. He's undateable, John. He's the he's the slacker surfer instructor. He's uh, oh, that's right, that's Stella right, Wars Zary, character. Yeah. And it's about um. It's it's just about these characters in AA and uh, my good friend Ron Robinson who was in uh, Jack and Cocaine with me and we did Edge of Incursion together, he he has a pretty big part in that as well too. So it was great to be on set with um, you know some friends of mine and then obviously like some new um, people I got the opportunity to work with was just uh, amazing. Nice. Uh, okay, so we talk a lot about the industry and all that type of stuff, but. I like to know what, what people are passionate about outside of the industry. Mm -hmm. So what other things do you t t tickle your fancy and that you, you find you, you have a, a passion for that maybe isn't equal to acting, but is, is, in the, in, is in the ballpark? You know, actually, my brother got me into golf recently, so we've been going to the golf course quite often. <laughs> my bro I mean, yeah, he, uh, my brother was, uh, he was the sports guy, I was the artist, so... You know, he turns me on to different sports and things like that. I've been going to the gym, taking hikes. I, I find, too, just even being in L.A. and with social media in general, you know, we're always looking at our phones. We're always like, you, I mean, even just my good friends, those about me, I'm, I'm always thinking of ideas or I'm always like, oh, wait, we got to do this. Or, yeah. Oh, wait, this yeah, is what oh, yeah, we got to do. always going. The, my ball is always going. I'm like, we, we got to call this person. We got to make this happen and get this. And it's really being able, those moments where I get to just turn off my phone, I just go for a nice walk up in the hill or just even just get away and get to the beach and just really um, let my mind ease. And then I notice when I come back from that, it just really, that's really when the good creativity you, uh, comes in. Are you a golf cart guy or do you do the walk? You know, it depends. If we go to Balboa, we get the golf cart and we go. For, it, it just depends on the mood. Sometimes we just do like a nine, uh, the nine hole one in studio. Say so we're like, okay, you know, we'll just walk, do our thing. We'll do the drive range. And then we'll go to Balboa and like rent the cart. And uh, yeah. All right. So we uh, we have a, a special. Oh, wait. Before I get to the special final question. Um, we have questions. What? Discord has questions. Well, oh. Discord's questions come after my questions. No. So undateable John. Besides, yes. we got we got distracted by John Philbin being in there. The mm -hmm. surprise name drop. Uh, Shannon Doherty's also in That's it correct. as well. Oh yeah. What uh, what was it like working with the nine hundred two one zero star? That was uh, okay. No, you have to uh, just so we we did a table read it. I knew that. So we the, I met the whole cast. So it was me. 
I don't think Ron had been cast in it yet, but I was there with, I had met Estella previously, but we were at a table with um, two other actors that were up. So it was like Estella and Daryl Hannah was there. She's in the movie as well. Oh, so wow. so I, had, I had met them and I knew they were in it. And then uh, Cynthia had this part, Adam, she was like, you know, cast, this is your part. We want, I, I, I wrote this for you. We're going to do it. I'm like, great. And so uh, there was, an, there, I think there was another woman who was supposed to play uh, the, the role opposite me. And they had someone and then it, I think something came up and they had to recast her at the last minute. I, I don't know the whole story, but so I literally was, you know, and they were like, okay, we're going to do this day. And, you know, you're just hoping you're still going to be in the movie. And so I'm literally driving to set and I get the call that, by the way, Shannon, Dor I'm like, what? And I was <laughs> like, it was so like, are, are you kidding me? And it was just so, it was just like, I mean, I was, at, you know, I actually knew Shannon. Stuff up my game today. Was, oh my gosh. It was like, so, I mean, I, I was ready for it too. I just remember driving, it, we, it was at this location up in the Hollywood Hills and, going to set but I mean I actually knew Shannon from my first the first thing I knew her from was Mallrats uh you know I'd seen that on DVD and I'd gotten into Kevin Smith and uh that movie and then I had no and then you know, I was younger when 902 when I was actually on so I didn't you know but I after I saw Mallrats when I was a little kid I I you know was watching the 902 and I'm like oh that's the girl from Mallrats and so I put it together I mean and yeah of yeah. course I know I know you know her name and what she is but by that time when we shot this, I obviously was, was like, oh my God, no, no, two, and no, this is like so cool. And then, um, so I get to the set and it was, um, John had just finished some scenes with his mother who was Meredith Baxter and I was a big, you know, Michael J. Fox Family Ties fan, so meeting her and she was such a lovely Got lady. all sorts of people in this. It was just a, a magical set and then we, um, I got called in to run my lines with Estella and so they were, um, it was just funny, so Estella was getting made, she's like, Cash, come in, let's run lines. Like, okay, so then I have like these two makeup girls working, you know, just touching me up and everything. And then Shannon walks in, so I'm like, it's just, it was just a funny thing. I'm doing rhymes, and then these two girls are doing makeup on my face, and I'm like, hello, nice to meet you, hi. And then, <laughs> and then she wants to run lines, so I'm like in the middle, going back and forth. We're doing this, and that was the first time we'd like ran the scene together. Was when we were in makeup, and then we just jumped in, we did it, and it was so much fun. Nice, nice. Question about uh, actor protocol. Yeah. Are do actors like? Are what's the ruling on like so? Her, her most famous role is 90210. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of like the, the taboo area? Or from actor to actor, when you guys are at craft services, is it okay, what was it like on 90210? Or is it just like that? Everybody asks me that. You can't ask that. So an, another example. You work with a famous actor, and they, they had a, a, an iconic role. Is that Are they sick of talking about that? Or is it actor to actor okay to ask them about past performances? Oh, you know, I, um, I, know, I know what you're saying. I, I didn't get a chance. I mean... When we shot Undateable John, it was just real. I mean, I was, you know, I mean, this was like a big thing for me at the time. I mean, it still is a huge thing. And, you know, so I'm on set and, you know, you just, my focus was just, I just want to do the best work I can right now. And we would just joke around about the set and everything. We didn't really get an opportunity to discuss uh, things. But I mean, but like when we wrapped, it was just, it was, just, we had a moment. It was like, you know, it was such an honor to work with you. Thank you. We took a picture together and it was, um, after we wrapped, it was, it was amazing. But we didn't have, but, no, I mean, I have found there's people that I've been able to have those conversations yeah. with about their most iconic roles, yeah. Because I, I feel like I totally want to ask, yeah. but I totally feel like I don't want to be that guy, no, no, so I, I, I'd hide that the whole time, but it'd be, be hankering to, 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 to drop the question. Of course. Okay, so before we get to the Discord questions from, from our, mm -hmm. our community, we have our final question that I've uh, taken to asking of our guests. Mm -hmm. And we didn't prep you for this question, Cash, so it's coming as complete surprise. Bring it on. Do you know when you first joined Facebook and what your first Facebook post was? Wow. <laughs> I think I joined maybe... No, it was about 10 years ago because I got the 10 year. Didn't they do some like, what was your last, um, remember everyone was matching their faces oh, all together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, mine was, it was, oh my gosh, it was, I mean, my hair's a little similar, but I was like wearing this like leather jacket with a stripe and I was, I was, um, yeah, that was it. I was at, I was in Hollywood just trying to look cool. And, yeah. So it was, it was early 2008. We've got your first post here. Throw it up on screen. Let's see that. It was actually other people in 2007 that oh, were wow. tagging on your page. You didn't make your first official post until <laughs> mid 2008, and your first like official post right was. Oh, wow. Well, you're on Facebook. It's yeah, Oh, dude, everybody was excited to see Cash Hovey on Oh, my Facebook. gosh. Wow. For the first Anne, year, that's all wow. it is, is people welcome yeah. to your Facebook. And that girl, but that's Anne. No, she's a childhood friend of mine. I actually just ran into her in um, on Rodeo not too long ago. Expect and... a call. 
<laughs> okay, I so have... the first official thing what? we've got you down as saying on Facebook is Cash is saying cheers to a week concluded. Can, that's remember, they, remember it used to say what are you doing right now oh yeah okay oh wow yeah that's why it's so weird because everyone did that was that memorial like, uh, you know I, it, was oh, that memorial, memorial day weekend day, memorial day weekend okay yeah I, I guess I was excited <laughs> for memorial day I, I was going to a party alright <laughs> okay wow. Andrea what do we uh, what do we have for the discord questions okay, oh so yeah. I don't get to see the was, was the picture accurate do you want to see the other one I can pull that let's back. see the picture Oh, do picture. I want to see the... Oh, no, I was you curious. the picture? No, those are the... Oh, okay, no, I, I was pretty sure that was my yeah. first profile picture. Okay. Like, Bring on the... You wanted to go back and read Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okie dokie. So, we have a couple of questions going back to the acting side. What was your first step to getting into acting? First step, I think it was... I think it was the moment that... Actually, the other girl who... Um, posted that comment her brother and I were really good friends and uh, we did some of those early movies genuinely yeah her brother Matt was uh, a good friend of mine at the time and he was the one we you know grew up together we shared a passion for movies and he really introduced me to a lot of things that I just didn't know about actors and pop culture and stuff like that so us just getting our camera together and recreating our favorite scenes that was really the step before we started taking acting classes and at the time I think he he was already doing auditions and he was he was a little older and he was going up for some big stuff so he um, yeah, he was kind of showing me the ropes. Were your parents okay with that? I mean, because you were still kind of a teenager, mm -hmm. a kid, and you were going to auditions. Like, mm -hmm. were they okay with you just going around the city? Like, people forget L.A. is huge. Oh, yeah. Well, they might be. And it's terrible to child actors. Three block area. Yeah. Like, you can go anywhere for right. auditions. Definitely. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, my, my mom was like, she like, she was the one who... Um, was always there for me for day one as far as acting. Like, she wanted to do it. My dad kind of was more... You know, I mean, I mean, now he's coming around, I'll say that. But he, um, yeah, at the time, my mom was really the one who encouraged it and was, like, taking me to auditions and doing everything. Were either of your parents cool. associated with the industry at all or had... Oh, yeah, definitely. My, oh, yeah, I mean, my dad, um, well, my dad was in the uh, music industry. He was an executive and did uh, music publishing. And then, uh, so, yeah, I was, we were always around it. And, you know, my mom had had different jobs in the industry as well, too. Okay. Yeah. Did they try and get you thinking about musical interests instead of... You know, people always, like, I, and the thing is, I work with musicians and I, I love music I've just always been more passionate about film but they you know it's just music industry and uh, the movie industry they just you know they work together in so many ways and so Every many things cross over music. oh yeah so would you say your friends gave you the acting bug or was there something that as a child made you want to act me like instead of being shy like mm -hmm. some kids are like you actually embraced it and saw the fun in that like what I was always really shy until I put a camera on, honestly. If you even just see sometimes I'm just so to myself. But when I, you get me talking about passionate things about movies, then it's, I find like I become alive. And actually that was first noticed when I did – we did a play in middle school. And it was like the first – like I was like the shy kid. And then the sec, I had to play like a Dracula character. So the second I had the makeup on and I had the count thing and the accent, everyone was like, whoa, okay, that's cool. So and to have that kind of response, like, okay, we got to go with this. That's awesome. I that can totally see you cool. as an Edwin vampire. <laughs> so, if you could star alongside anyone, who would it be and why? Oh my gosh. Um, I mean, you're saying like any movie. Like, I mean, I would you go for... Be dead or alive. D oh, dead or alive. Absolutely any actor. If you Just to make the pool as wide as possible for you to <laughs> choose from. Ideal to work alongside anyone who you think would make you rise to the occasion and would show the best that you can do who mm -hmm. would you want to be acting across from? i mean honestly like a dream come true job would be in like a uh de niro scorsese with dicaprio i mean i grew up just watching like taxi driver was a very another pivotal movie for me and so then are you telling us you're not in the englishman what i'm not not yet nope. <laughs> <laughs> maybe this interview will help with that but yeah if uh I, i'm i'm here and ready when you want me but you like the gruff, like, real characters that make you act. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was watching Goodfellas and Departed growing up. It's just, I love just those kind of uh, character developments. And, like, Scorsese's a director. Like, it could be three or four hours. I'm just, I'm just totally yeah. invested in what he does. So is there anything specific about Scorsese as a director, like his style, that there's something that you just, you wish more directors would do? Well, and, you know, and um, another uh, per is Tarantino. I mean, I was, I mean, actually, um, sorry, Mom, I'm going to do this to you. My mom let me watch Pulp Fiction with her when I was 10 because she, <laughs> I still have a Pulp Fiction shirt from when I was 10 years old. And, but she, but in, 
Yeah. My defense is she probably put her coffee in the back. Yeah, I was going to an LA private school, all the other kids. So I'm like, Mom, I got it. And she was hesitant, but then it was like she watched it with me, and it was just like she understood, like there was this artistic. I'm missing all the puns, it. Mom. I gotta catch up. <laughs> of course, a lot of things I didn't understand until. You know, like, you know, each, every year yeah, you yeah. watch it, but that's like Pulp Fiction for me is just a movie that I have to watch like at least once a year. And same with like Departed and Wolf of Wall Street. There's just I just love like just character driven movies oh, yeah, with just absolutely. such a great cast. And is there any uh, project either on the indie level or at the top of the food chain floating around Hollywood right now that you're aware of that you would love to to be a part of uh, playing in that sandbox? Well, I mean, look, I mean, if you want to put me in an Avengers movie, I'll totally take that in a heartbeat. But, you know, when you... you uh... work out, <laughs> Oh, dude, no, I would love to just be able to do stunts, get on a set. I'm, I'm ready for anything right now. Have you seen those Brie Larson workout thing videos? I haven't seen the video, like, but... Yeah. She's pushing SUVs, like, her back up against it. She's uh, insane, amazing how long, how much she can do now that they're like... She couldn't even lift herself up, do a pull-up, and now she can... Wow. Oh, it's insane. I, I gotta watch that. I mean, I, I think she's a phenomenal <laughs> an actress. And, oh, yeah. Yes, to you be... are definitely <laughs> avenging something. Holy mm-hmm. cow. <laughs> so you've worked with a lot of female directors. That's correct. a lot of male directors. Mm-hmm. So you know the best of both worlds. Mm-hmm. What is a huge difference, like a glaring difference between styles, just in general, between mm-hmm. male directors and female directors? Yeah, and, and I'm not trying to get out of this question or just to say like, oh, you know, I, I don't know. It's just... I mean, like, I love people, and it's just every experience has been just different and unique in, in, in its own way. I mean, just um, the director of As and Kevin was different than the director of um, Undateable John. Jack and Cocaine was different from Plastic Daydream. And, and it wasn't like anything that I could say, like, oh, this is, like, it was just, it was just like creative people trying to get the best out of um, the performance. And I really haven't been on a set where I can say, like, oh, you know, this was this way and I didn't approve of this. I mean, everything that, to my knowledge, has been very um, uh, professional. And That's probably the best answer because regardless of gender, each of the creative directors stood on their own two feet mm-hmm. and and was their own person and their own individual. Because like the, the sweeping... See, for me, this, this the whole diversity logjam, I think it, 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 it it's kind of dyslexic because I think the problem starts with distribution. Because for so long, the things that are getting distributed, the, the things that are getting mainstream audience are a very select, narrow demographic of type of content and all of that. And when you're trying to get money for a film, when you're trying to produce a movie, when you're trying to get all these things done made, when you're trying to get all these things made, the business side of it always starts with the distribution and works backwards. Well, who are your actors in it? What's the demographic of it? What quadrants does it go for? All these different things. And all they want to see is stuff that's based on past results. What are the past results? What are the past results? Right. But if you only allow a certain type of content traditionally to be distributed on a mainstream level, then you're only going to have that type of content existing as the comparables. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it kind of creates a self-fulfilling self-fueling cycle when you continue to use the the distribution bias as the green lighting uh qualifiers for productions and that and i think that just keeps feeding into the diversity issues that people have well movies with 30 uh, something year old white male leads traditionally do real well well that's because primarily that's the most of the stuff you've been distributing and pumping down the food chain so of course that stuff's going to look on paper like it did well mm-hmm. and i think until we really democratize the distribution side. I think that's really what's going to hold up the the floodgates of opportunities for everybody really coming to fruition. Mm. I mean, Rick, I mean, you know, I just think it, it starts with the artists and what we do. I mean, and even just, I mean, like re- for as recently, I uh, I just I was asked to do this host a film block at Film Fest LA Live. They called it Cashovian Friends, and we, you know, Plastic Daydream was part of that block. Um, my good friend uh, Serena Laurel, she won Best Actress uh, for her performance, and oh, nice. uh, and um, we had, I mean, we had. Um, it happened again last night. It was uh, a very powerful short film. About... Uh, we actually know the producer of it happened again last night. Which one? Uh, Tony Di Bene- Di- Tony Di Benedetto. Okay. Uh, he's he's one of our board members for Gratway. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. Uh, was he there at the the festival? No, um, that was. 
she yeah well you know it, it starred Gabrielle Stone she was the other producer on it and she was um she I believe she was in New York at an event she couldn't come but she yeah they've been going all around with that one too. she it's oh my gosh I mean she, she won so many awards uh, and um yeah no she, uh, Gabrielle's just really a talent everyone needs to look out for that girl was, was, going was she the the main actr- actress she was the main actress in it yeah, yeah I think uh, Tony's been telling me about this actress that was in that that the, for that was great and phenomenal I got to see her but th- that does that hurt? You know, it happened again last night is Gabrielle Stone she wrote produced and directed it okay yeah and uh it's what i mean that was at holly shorts um i believe beverly hills film fest i went to the north hollywood sin fest and um, sydney sweeney's also in it as well too she'll be in tarantino's we got all sorts of cross connections there's so many cross connections (laughs) and um but um we we premiered i mean or we premiered our movie gabrielle had her movie in there we had serena we had my good friend rochelle uh, Jimmy Shin, who hosts the uh, the Shindig show at the Comedy Store, and uh, Ron Robinson, who we've had multiple collaborations with. But, you know, these were all just very unique artists who were just creative in their own ways. And I just, it, for me, it was just we had so many different personalities, so many different styles in one block. And even, and, and it was actually a predominantly female um, directed um, block. And we, there was an acknowledgement about that. Not that we were looking for one, but people pointed yeah, that out. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it was just, you know, it wasn't planned in any particular way. We just, these were the people that I wanted to have in the block. That's the these best way it should yeah. happen. It should happen organic. Right. Because if you're not picking people because they're female, you're making the same bias that, that was being done on the other side. Mm-hmm. Pick the best person and, and don't let the, the gender play in a role and you're going to find a lot of great, talented women. Definitely. Uh, every, everywhere we look, we keep finding great ladies that we want to work with and, 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 and help push the push the cart forward yeah so uh andrew do we have any more discord questions uh two questions left okay okay first one which is your favorite role that you have tried so far what has i guess pushed you further as an actor okay so most challenging role to date more fulfilled while doing the role like right. an actor that thrill of knowing that you're doing something you're feeling it you're getting across which one which pushed you the hardest? Uh, definitely Jack and uh, the movie Jack and Cocaine. I mean, it was um, it was a six day shoot. I, in, the, in that particular movie, I play um, I'm a drug addicted uh, street hustler. So I mean, I was lit, I was a lot skinnier than I, I mean. I really got into physical shape for that. And then there were I mean, and because there was no budget, we shot this guerrilla style and we did it in six days. And it was just this journey we decided to do. And How it was. How long was the script? The script, it was about, it's about, it's not, it's uh, 95 minutes to watch. It's, oh. it's like a feature. So I was carrying, I'm on a feature in six days. Yeah. Did wow. you do it in Fuck. order? Like, for Thought I pushed the Oh, no, we, we just shot, sequence. it was, a, oh, no, we just had to do what was available. We, um, we went to a, I, actually, one of the first, the first days of shooting, we probably, it was a 12 hour day and I was, we shot so many scenes and there's long stuff. And one of them was where my character was going through withdrawals. And I just have this wig out and I'm explaining something. And that was literally me. Like probably I had probably just had a banana that morning. I'm probably on my 10th cup of coffee that day. So I'm doing my lines, but some of the jitters were kind of so natural. There was some natural stuff. And then to have to stop doing that. And then because it's a love story with myself and the other character, her name's uh, Christy cocaine in the, in the script, you know, so it was just really having to do those intense roles. And then there's like, you know, there are, you know, some intimate scenes that we, so it was just really to go back and forth. You know, you really are like, wow, we have to get all these shots done. We have to get all these scenes done. So it was like to, it, it, I mean, it took a toll, but it was just really, I felt like that's where the discipline started for me was carrying that movie and, you know, make, and I, I was carrying it. I mean, I was, it was a leading role, but I had just so much support and help from everyone who was involved. That is awesome. Mm-hmm. Have you been that a villain intense. yet? I think you know. I think lately I've been kind of playing villains mostly. I mean, I'm kind of a villain in the. Um... Yeah, plastic daydream. I guess you're kind of. I guess I'm kind of okay. Real okay. I'm glad you said that. Thank you for saying that. No, because I feel like he's a good guy, right? I mean, in no way were you the bad guy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do you hear that? I'm not the bad guy. There's no way I can make this case without giving spoilers. So it's good. I cried. Oh well, that means a lot. No, that yeah, you cried because of what he did. No. No. Really not no, a bad guy. I can't give away. No, like I said, away. I can't make this case without giving spoilers away. Uh-huh. Okay, so the last question: mm-hmm. Would you ever want to write your own movie? Since you know kind of what your next level is as an actor, what you'd like to be pushed to do, the kind of role that mm-hmm. if you could ever come across it, would you ever want to write a story? Like, do you have something swishing around in your head that? You know, if you could ever do a certain kind of scene, kind of thing, oh. where you could build a movie off of a scene that you would like to 
do to show you can do? Like, have you thought about that? You know, like, here's how I go about writing. Like, in the, like when we did the, um, even after Jack and Cocaine, and there was, we did this web series with Catherine Bayless called Another Blackout, and that was predominantly written by a writer partner that I had at the time. Now, she came up with the concept, and then but how we worked was we went back and forth, and I was like, you have the concept down, I'm good at filling in the dialogue. And then we did another episode, and one of my friends who we just, again, we're just two people, we just click every time we talk. We just literally were just having coffee. I'm like, this is the scenario. And we wrote something down and then we shot it recently. So if I find something that I'm really passionate about that I want to do, then I can be like, okay, I know this character. I know what I want to do. But I just, I, for me to like, like there's just certain people who are just gifted at writing and they know, but it's like, once I know the scenario, I'm like, okay, I know how to make this more realistic or this is what this person would say. But to take on like a gigantic role, I have to be like so passionate about the character and the work. And I really hope that happens because... I, I write so much down. I'm always writing my thoughts down because I like to know what I'm going through and it just helps me express and get things out in general. So I'm always writing and then sometimes an idea just pops out that I can go with. So we'll we'll see, but I'm, I'm very open to that and would love the opportunity. That would be awesome. Yeah. I've got a follow-up question. Of course. What, uh, what do you want your legacy to be in the industry outside of just your talent and as an actor? If you could have like an impact or something that, that changed the way the industry is done, what kind of impact would you want to have? No, you know, I mean, honestly, I mean, uh, I've always just wanted to be a, a great actor and make good movies, but I think that we are at a um, a point in time, just not even just in our industry, but in the world where, you know, changes are being made and people are reevaluating, you know, how we, you know, just, I, I think we're, we're at a time in history right now where a lot of change is happening and I'm seeing so many just passionate young people in all their fields, like, you know, doing their best work, you know? I mean, there's yeah. just so many just young actors I talk to. There's so many just young uh, computer programmers. I mean, we're just really on this new level of way of thinking and way of going about business. And so, um, you know, I, I really think it's important to, you know, be a good person and know how you can make an impact. And I think it starts in our own communities. Like when I'm on a set, when I'm working with my, my colleagues, it's like, you know, it's treating everyone with respect, knowing how we all complement each other making things happen and that's that's the kind of legacy if i could have a legacy i would really want to have that nice nice all right cash well um is there anything you want to plug here while we before we wrap up the show i just well thank you both for having me thank oh, you to my post she's been coming. sitting here Rhonda collins shout out monarch pr Woohoo! thank you for this and um yeah i guess uh undateable john's coming out in the summer and uh you know kathy and i were um we have some more festivals in the works and just uh, really just shout out to everyone who's just been part of this journey. It's just, you know, I've just catching you know, up with it. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you know when a uh, uh, premiere date's going to be for Undateable John yet? I just know the date was early June is what they said. They, um, a distributor, Stadia Media, picked it up, said it's going to be early June. So when we have a premiere date and... Uh, yeah, we're going to need to know that one because I want to I see... Oh, definitely. You, you'll I want to see you. I want to see John Philbin. There's a bunch of people. Definitely. Do you see. hear that? We need an Undateable John premiere. So Absolutely. let's do this. Let's do this to synergize the release date. I think we can do this. <laughs> no, we can do this. We will do this, right? All right, Cash. Thank you thank very you much so for much being on the show. On. It's always a pl and really, I just want to thank you both too for like coming to our premieres, and you guys ah. have just been so supportive. And it's just it's always a pleasure. Yeah, it was the least we could do. All you guys came and supported the hundredth episode, and and Kathy was there. We we greatly enjoyed her her coming on the show and and, and talking with us and all that. So to come support her project, uh, see what you guys are up to and doing, that was that was a no brainer. We were we happy to be there. Full circle. We'll have you here today. <laughs> yep, yep. This is yeah. it's been so much fun. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm gonna I'm gonna close out the show here. So if you you want to hang out for a minute or two, we're gonna wrap it up. Uh, if you want to run off stage, you're you're more than welcome to. But we're we're bringing it in for a landing. There's gonna be no Emily's corner this week because Emily's having technology issues in her corner. Huh. Uh, the Discord questions were all geared towards cash this week, and without John, the bullet blitzes are gonna be on hold for now until we figure out what we're doing with the co-host. So uh, thanks to Cash Hovey for being here. Next week, we're going to have Jenny Piat, uh, music supervisor in studio. And Fridays, we've got Apex Legends tournaments. We've got uh, Red Dead Redemption duels. And we've also got uh, Fight Club on Fridays at Gratwick Gaming on Twitch. Andrea, I'm going to take us out of the show here. Fuck this shit, I'm out. And bring this thing Fuck in. Fuck this shit, I'm out. I'm Start out. closing Don't song here. Me. I'ma just grab my stuff and leave. Excuse me, please. Fuck this shit, I'm out. Nope. Fuck this shit, I'm out.